So Jesus initiates the conversation on the descent from the mountain, and he does it by giving them some orders. Yes, sir. Okay, what's Jesus say? Okay, you guys have just seen all this. Do not tell anyone what they have seen until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. That's not a suggestion. That is a command. He tells them, and this is like the first time in all of the gospel of Mark where Jesus tells someone to not tell, and they didn't tell. This is the first. It's the first place. Now, I imagine if it's Peter, James, and John, it's just three of you, and Jesus is telling you, don't, don't tell what you saw until after the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Well, one, you're so overwhelmed with what you saw that you can't help but share, but you can't share with everybody else. So anytime the three, Peter, James, and John, are together, I guarantee you, what do you think they're going to talk about? What in the world was that that we witnessed? That was amazing. I'd never seen Moses before. Anybody see him in a photo? No. Anybody see Elijah? No. Is there any drawings? No. And yet they had that, and it's like, wow. They couldn't get over the experience of the encounter that they saw. But I think just as equal to the magnificent event that they just witnessed was the confusing understanding of what does he mean by the Son of Man rising from the dead. We can tell this secret, we can tell this experience after the Son of Man rises from the dead. What's he mean by that? So they got two things that, that are just kind of weighing upon them. What, what do you think he meant? And so as they're coming down, Jesus gives them the orders, and as they're further down, one of the things that I love is that you can ask questions with Jesus. You can ask questions. Now, they're not going to ask, what do you mean by rising from the dead? No, they kind of backpedal and say, The teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first. Why? Why must Elijah come first? Hmm. That's kind of coming around the back door to saying, how is this thing going to wind up? You know, they're all thinking that when the Messiah comes, Rome is going to be overthrown, Israel's going to flourish and the Messiah will reign and rule with all power and authority, and everything's going to be absolutely wonderful. And so here their, their question, why must Elijah come first? The scribes say that Elijah must come first, and I, I imagine they're, they're repeating this quite regularly because everybody's thinking that Jesus possibly could be the Messiah. And if you're up to date on The Chosen, you know that it's, you know, this last episode where he comes out and he's letting them know he's the Messiah because John's disciples want to know, you know, are you really the one or should we look for another? And he's, he uses the Isaiah passage and he, and he shows that once again, the blind see, the deaf hear, the poor have the good news preached to them and blesses anyone who's not offended by me saying, yes, I am the Messiah. So here they are. They're, they're still kind of struggling because Jesus' role as the Messiah isn't fitting in with what they had perceived it to be. They thought that when the Messiah come, it was going to be all-out war. It was going to be a victory, a political, a, a military conquest. And here they're, they're, they're struggling with it. No doubt the scribes kept saying, but Elijah has to come first. Why? Jesus can't be the Messiah because Elijah hasn't come first. It's a, it's a coming in 
backhandedly to the, to the reality that Jesus isn't the Messiah because Elijah hasn't come. And because Elijah hasn't come, this can't be the Messiah. Hmm. Now Jesus is perceiving what's going on, I believe, inside of them. And uh, they understand, their understanding comes from Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, and it says, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I would come and strike the land with a curse. Okay? So Jesus answers their question. To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Hmm. I don't know about you, but I, you know, I'm kind of putting myself in the disciples' sandals, and I, I'm thinking, okay, if Elijah comes first and restores all things, then why are you talking about the Son of Man having to rise from the dead? Why would he be rejected? Why would he be suffering? Why would there be any of that if Elijah comes first and restores everything? If he comes first and restores everything, it's, it's like he comes, he's the voice in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and as he makes the path straight and announcement, and then the Messiah should just come right in, and there shouldn't be any difficulty. But there seems to be some difficulty. <clears throat> now they've got to rethink, what does Jesus mean by quoting that Elijah will come and restore all things. What kind of things are going to be restored? It kind of blew a hole in their whole end times triumphant, rah, 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 Israel wins and everybody else loses. Hmm. And Jesus is already anticipating their thoughts. And he says, why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? And he doesn't answer that question right here. But he's been talking with them, preparing them for what he's about to endure, the suffering, the abuse, uh, all the pain that's coming. <clears throat> 